Boardroom Bound, Episode 69, Championing Diversity and Inclusion in the Boardroom with Felicity Hassan. I know that no company would ever say that they're hiring for a body at a team, but they are. You know, if you've just lost a critical player on a team, you have a time horizon in which to fill that role. And unfortunately, diversity is the first thing to fall off the priority list. Hello, and welcome to this episode of Boardroom Bound. My name is Alexander Lowry, and this is the podcast dedicated to intentional leadership in the boardroom. My goal is to give aspiring and existing directors the tips, tactics, and strategies necessary to transform your confidence and build a successful career as a board director. Quick reminder, you can get all of today's show notes at podcast.gordon.edu. And in today's show, we're speaking with Felicity Hassan, and she helps run Audalis, which is a retained executive search firm that seeks to level the playing field for diverse talent in the boardroom. So you can imagine the candidates they are putting forward may not have gotten on slates at other firms. But this is actually really helpful for us, not only because we believe in diversity in the boardroom, but everyone listening to the show is thinking, how do I position myself for the boardroom? And Audalis is helping candidates think outside the box to get opportunities and credibility, something that we can all learn from and prepare. You're going to take away a lot from this show. Let's jump into it. Felicity Hassan, welcome to the Boardroom Bound podcast. Thank you very much for having me. I am excited to have you here today because we talk with people uh, either on this show directly or about the industry directly. We think about retained search firms. And your model is a bit different. And I love your model. I love what you're doing. And it fits in what we also talk about in this show a lot. I'll just use the word diversity. And diversity can mean lots of different things for different people. And we'll talk about that a lot today. And you sandwich those together. And I think we have what you do with Audalis. And I would love to talk about that for audience to unpack it. But before I do that, let's just set the scene. So you didn't get to the position you are today by overnight. You did a lot of stuff in your career to build to it and position you for that unique role that you're in now. And let's just give us some context for our audience. Absolutely. Um, and thank you so much for starting that way. So you're right. It's been an interesting journey for me through my career. And um, like many, I have, like many women in the recruiting industry and women across various industries, I've faced my own challenges because of my, my gender. Um, many of them fall into a Me Too category, I'm sure. Uh, but as my career has evolved, um, I've become significantly more aware of actually my privilege as a white woman hmm. in this space and have become increasingly aware of the broader ramp, remit of, of diversity. So this opportunity that I'm in today is incredible for me. So I started my career in London back in, in 2003 in search. I then moved out to New York in 2008. And as you can hear, I'm clinging on to my accent for dear life. Um, stayed in search for, for three years and then actually transitioned over to Bloomberg where I spent three years, which also gave me a real insight into that organization's incredible commitment to diversity across the board. Um, and then followed our fantastic CHRO, um, Anne Ernie, who actually started her HR career um, in banking and finance, but then transitioned into a DNI role um, over to Audible, an Amazon company. So just had an incredible opportunity to learn about the importance of diversity as it relates to talent strategy. And then a great friend of mine who, who we, we started our careers together 17 odd years ago now, had started Audelis back in 2011 with the sole purpose of really kind of um, changing the perspective of the executive search world, which doesn't always have a great reputation. He wanted to create a firm that really listens, where you can create an, an environment for candidates where they really feel valued. Um, so he created Ordella uh, with the sole purpose of leveling the playing field for diverse talent. Our general methodology is that that incorporates widening the gate rather than lowering the bar. Hmm. So we are always out there looking for the best possible talent for opportunities, but with the, the thought process in the back of our mind that we need to make sure that we're, we're bringing a, a, a greater amount of diversity into the funnel at the front end. So not only is it important to me from a professional perspective, because I understand the moral imperative and the business case for diversity, and that's something which I think is extremely important, 
But I'm also a woman who's faced my own challenges. I also now happen to be married to an Egyptian and have two mixed race children. So this is both a professional priority for me and a personal one as well. So very excited about what we've been able to achieve on the Ordellis side. And we also have a sister company involved that offers consulting and inclusion solutions as well to help the individuals that we place, but also the broader organizations that we work with to actually ensure that those individuals are successful in their careers, which I think is an incredibly important part of that puzzle. And just to help our audience understand this, so when we think of executive search firms, we might be talking about, you know, a Spencer Stewart or a Hydric and Struggles. Those are some of the names that probably pop up in people's minds. And I've had one of the partners at Hydric and Struggles, he said, we have made a commitment as an organization. We are only going to put up boards that are at least 50-50 gender, and we're going to ensure diversity that way. That's very important to us. You have an opportunity where you built a company, so you got to have your own principles and start it from scratch in a certain way versus organizations like those that we just talked about who are perhaps uh, adjusting their different processes and policies and systems to match a different world today. Help us understand a, a bit of that difference and what it means that you guys are able to operate differently. That's a great point. And I want to preface you know, any comments that I make with, I, I cannot tell you how thrilled and excited I am that all of those conventional traditional search firms are beginning to really kind of jump on, on this course and work with purpose and identify the importance of diversity when they're doing their search work. It is absolutely critical. And they are, they are well-known and well-respected, and it's important that they play their part. So I'm absolutely thrilled that they are getting involved in this space because this is not something we should be competing against. This is something that we should all be doing as standard. The one thing which I would say we have been doing to kind of differentiate ourselves, and as you mentioned, something that we've had the advantage of doing from day one, is this has always been a priority for us. This is not something that we've pivoted to. This has always been our priority. So we have... We have nine years on them <laughs> in terms of creating a process which specifically resonates with a more diverse audience. So if you think about the traditional search process, it hasn't necessarily always been particularly fair to the diverse community. You know, there's a lot of individuals who come from a different background or from you know a different gender or a different ethnic orientation. Um, that have not been appropriately represented by search firms. They've been perhaps presented as token candidates. And therefore, there's a way in which we approach the market which is much more sensitive to that. So we're much more candidate first. So we tend to kind of, we tend to steer away from business development, which is something which we tend to get organically because organizations that are motivated to drive diversity within their within their boardroom or their executive suite organically come to us through our connections, which we're very fortunate about. Um, and so we can focus entirely on our, our candidates. And every part of our process is really tailored to making sure that we put our candidates first and that they really feel that in the process. And that as a result, they understand how important their candidacy is to our clients. And so not only do we have the network of different candidates to begin with, due to the virtue of all the work we've been doing over the course of the past nine years. Um, but we, but we also, you know, we're also able to deliver on those results. So we have we have the network, and we're we're able to deliver the results. And let me paint the scene for our audience. So if we take gender out, uh, background, anything like that for a minute, we just talk about a candidate A versus a candidate B. Historically, when board seats are filled, you would have to have been a sitting or retired CEO. And then they widen the pool, sitting or retired CFO, right? So now we're widening the pool and we would say C-suite. And then there are a lot of people who are, if you're in a mega corporation right below the C-suite, probably lead a huge P&L, and you would argue, I have the equivalent experience, I've got a large group of people reporting into me, and if people are still using the historical definitions, well, you're not ready, you don't have that title, you're not the right role. And if I just use generic language, in some ways what you're describing is someone who is ready by different definitions we can describe it, but it wouldn't have been thought about because they didn't check a certain box. Is that a fair way for audience to think about it? Yeah, absolutely. I think 
I think it's really important that we identify that we've got like a really standard way of operating here. From from the boardroom perspective, in my in my personal view, I would say that there is, to your point, a very established way of looking at how they've recruited the boards in the past. And it's not just that CEO or um, or CFO or general counsel type profile that has historically kind of come into the boardroom. But let's face it, it's also the you know, from the golf club, we know the mm-hmm. kind of general demographics that we're looking at here. It's, it's generally been from the old boys network. It's the extent that women have been able to infiltrate it. It's often been the same women. It's often been white women who've been able to kind of jump into those roles. So I think you're absolutely right. What, the, what your audience needs to be thinking about is how do I differentiate myself, but also how do we start to disrupt that model? And it takes all of us, kind of, it takes a collective thought. And, I, and I'm incredibly fortunate in terms of the partnerships that I've been able to form with some, some very influential women, be it, you know, Kate Luzio over at Luminary or Lynn Coughlin at C200 or Edie at WBC. These are phenomenal women of phenomenal organizations who've been able to really kind of think about, like, how we disrupt the boardroom in order to kind of make sure that the boards are understanding the risk that they're taking of not looking at candidates who bring critical skill sets that will be applicable to the future of business as opposed to what they're doing today. So I'll, I got off the phone a couple of hours ago with um, a phenomenal neuroscientist who specializes in AI and and machine learning. If you speak to her about the presence of tech expertise and AI and machine learning in the boardroom, she was very polite about it, but ultimately the crux of our conversation was it's vertical. You, you, you don't have really any kind of expertise in that area. And ultimately that is a big risk for organizations if they don't have representation for their board that really kind of looks into culture and um, organizational structure and and technology and all of these factors that are becoming so mission critical as we think about new generations coming into the workplace and what the workplace is fundamentally going to look like in five or ten years time. Like we need we need to kind of retain some of those traditional facets of what the boardroom offered, but we also really need to be thinking about those unconventional candidates for the boardroom in order to make sure that we're actually having the impact that we need to have on these organizations and pushing those, that decision-making in the right direction. So your audience, I think, is kind of continuing to sort of highlight the importance of that difference in the context of, like, the future of the workforce. Um, and for anyone in a chair or in a nominating committee seat to really kind of think about, like, how they're going to disrupt their model in terms of how they recruit to actually really factor that in. I, I mean... It, I think you'll agree with me on the executive side. We're pretty sophisticated about how we recruit. And we're also pretty creative about how we do it, or becoming more so. On the boardroom, it just hasn't changed in a very long time. And it needs to. It's it's ripe for disruption. I agree with you, but here's something that I've never been able to wrap my head around. And uh, as a father of two daughters, I'm a big fan of more diversity in the boardroom. I, I'm thrilled to be on the steering committee for 2020 Women on Boards. There's a 30% club. There's a lot of groups doing some great work trying to move the needle. And we're headed in the right direction. We're not where we want to be yet, but we're going there, right? And we can talk about the ways that we get there and how we'll get there. And what I find fascinating is it seems like we are making good progress in the boardroom. I think we are actively seeing great progress and the train seems to be going where the direction we want it to go in. What I find really interesting is if you think about the feeder system, if we want to call it that, traditionally to the boardroom is in the C-suite. We are not getting the same progress in the C-suite as we are in the boardroom. I know that you help work with organizations on both of those sides. What are your thoughts around that? I can't disagree with you about the executive suite. I think that it will, it has historically taken longer than we had hoped to impact this change. And it's really important that we start to expedite that process. And so from my perspective, it is around constantly thinking about how to do things 
differently. And again, and I have no different view on the executive side than I do on the board. We have to be disruptive about how we're recruiting. If we constantly have the same input, then we can't suddenly assume different outputs from the process. So on the executive side, we look at search. We obviously look at conventional search, and, and we, we push down that road. But we're a boutique search firm. We're only going to make X number of appointments in a year. Now, the trickle-down effect of those, of those appointments should be massive, and we're very committed. 65% um, of our executive appointments are diverse, and they have been that way since we, since we started our business in 2011. That's an enormous percentage. On the board side, it's actually 89% of our placements so diverse because usually the chairman is specifically looking, and it is usually a man, is specifically looking for, for diversity in the placement. So, you know, there is a very kind of intentional process and, and we embrace the executive, the, the search side, because as I say, there's a trickle down effect. If you put a if you put a, a female leader in place, you know, chances are suddenly that that group will become more diverse and so on and so forth. If you put a veteran or a person of color or any other kind of form of diversity into that role, you will see an, an increase in diversity within that team. That said, you know, we, we saw an opportunity to actually perhaps impact more difference. If you look at the senior leadership level, perhaps there's more critical mass of hiring. So we started a process of actually actively benchmarking for clients. So we've worked with a number of clients this year over a six to 12 month period to create an external bench of diverse talent for them. So we're avoiding any of the context of potentially excluding populations by intentionally going out and networking and sourcing candidates for future opportunities that have not yet opened. To give organizations the opportunity to proactively meet and form relationships with diverse candidates that they can then filter into a into a pool of talent when an opportunity emerges so that they will neither feel like they're compromising on talent, which is something which I find quite offensive when we're talking about diversity. I don't, I don't believe that diverse candidates represent compromise, but also you can't necessarily leverage the excuse that I would love a diverse candidate, but I, don't, I can't wait to find a diverse candidate. Okay, well, neither needs to be applicable then because we've given you six months of lead time to find great talent for an opportunity. So I think that there are, that has been a chance for our clients to actually really move the needle in terms of hiring significantly more diverse talent in over the course of a year, as opposed to waiting for an opportunity to emerge and then making a hire. So it's ideas like that. Look, that's not a revolutionary idea. Most organizations would tell you that they should be always looking for great talent. But unfortunately, the strategic imperative of always looking for great talent, because you never know when the right person is going to cross your, cross your door, cross your door um, is, often, is often outweighed by a tactical need to just get a body in a seat. And I know that no company would ever say that they're hiring for a body in a seat, but they are in many cases. You know, if you've just lost a critical player on a team, you have a time horizon in which to fill that role. And unfortunately, diversity is the first thing to fall off the priority list when that's the case. So I think there are many ways in which we can kind of push progress forward. I'm always happy to brainstorm with people about how to do that, but we have to be willing to change our processes and break things down and change job descriptions and think you know, more from a portfolio perspective about how we recruit. If you think about, you know, the traditions of recruiting, you know, some organizations, I, and this is something which I hear time and time again, well, this is just a profile that's always worked for us. Well, this is just how we've always done it. It's, it's the most exhausting thing to hear. And I understand it, and I appreciate, you know, that the risk aversion that comes with not wanting to break the mold. But we have to think. We have to start thinking differently if we really want to make an impact. Well, Felicity, along those lines, right, there's probably two parts of this. There's one, you pushing candidates up that you think are great and bringing them to organizations, and an organization can look and say, well, we don't think they're ready. Another part of that is the candidate also adjusting maybe their approach, 
their background, their experiences, so they are seen as more ready. So you are clearly counseling people on preparing. They might come to you and you say, not yet, I need you to do these things, or yes, you're ready. Here's how we change perhaps your packaging so you seem ready. And I think for all of our audience, whether they're male or female or from wherever they are in their career, all of those top tips will be really helpful. I would love to hear your perspective as someone who's constantly uh, contacting organizations and helping them find the right people. What does it look like for the right person to do outreach to you? For example, we had Russ Reynolds on the show, and he said, I don't need anybody to contact me. I know how to find the right people with my networks to, to get into the spots. Clearly, what you're saying is some organizations would say maybe they don't know how to plug into those places. So what does someone do to prepare themselves to raise their profile to become the type of person that you're able to take forward? So people don't necessarily come to me ready. I think this is a this is a process where you have to meet people where they are, and that and that applies to both candidates and clients. So I think whether it be an executive position or a board position, you have to be ready to actually really support them. I don't assume that I know everyone in the market, and I don't assume that the clients that I'm working with are completely prepared either. We have to we have to communicate, we have to partner really clearly, and we have to meet each other where we are. In many cases, I'll be working with a client, and they will be 100% committed to driving diversity forward and not in any way cognizant that what they're then subsequently briefing me on is absolutely littered with bias. <laughs> and it will take us some time to unravel what it is that they're looking for in order to ensure that it is it is now kind of the bias is removed and that they're much more open-minded about what it is that they're really looking for and really looking to get out of that headcount. So I think the most important thing is that you've got to, you've got to be preparing both the candidate and the client along the way. So from a candidate perspective, you really have to be thinking about how you're effectively selling your experience. You have to be very clear on your narrative, but you also have to understand you know, the importance of self-awareness through a process. So my thoughts with candidates are, I feel like with the emergence of uh, a more behavioral-based interview style where people where people are really kind of probing into your experience, particularly of it as it relates to the, the tech space, where people are really kind of probing into experiential examples of what you've been doing. You really need to make sure that when you're going into an interview, you're both prepared with your own narrative, your own backstory, and you know everything about you with all of kind of the obvious points that I would say should be common sense, which is what did you gain from your last opportunity? Nobody gains anything from from bad-mouthing an employer or offering kind of a negative narrative, you have to be looking at, you know, what are the positives that you gain from that opportunity and also what are, what are some of the things that, that are kind of guiding you into your search. You need to have a compelling narrative which is honest about your motivations but simultaneously doesn't kind of bring too much of a personal component in. And then you also have to have really clear examples and direction around what it is that you can actually bring to the table. And this requires real deep research into the organization, into the individuals that you're meeting. So when you're going into an interview, you really must insist on getting the information of the people that you're actually going to be meeting in that interview, or as much information as you can. Because it's imperative that you kind of demonstrate your intellectual curiosity in the individual that you're speaking to, their own background, how they got there, how that intersects with the example that you're giving in your background, who is the organization? What does the organization stand for? What are the principles and values of that organization? How do those principles and values intersect with your principles and values? And how is that demonstrated in, in the context of an example? That is not stuff that you're going to be thinking up on the spot in an interview environment. Your adrenaline's pumping. There is absolutely no way in the world. That is the kind of environment where I think of the great example as I leave the building. Guaranteed. There's absolutely no way that I'm thinking about all of that great stuff on my feet. So when I'm speaking to candidates, I probably spend, and, and my team are absolutely diligent about this, we spend a solid hour or so preparing them for interviews, which we hope precipitates several more hours of preparation behind closed doors. Not so that they feel like over-prepared and anxious about the situation, but so that they're really polishing up those examples so they can show the best of themselves. Because we want them to go in really confident. And simultaneously, who goes into an interview like 
graced with all the examples of things that have gone wrong in their career. Now, fundamentally, we know that at some point in an interview process, logically, somebody's probably going to ask us about examples of how we've kind of rebounded from a negative situation. But very rarely are those kind of situations the things that you bank in, ooh, things I must tell my future employer. So those are the kind of examples that you really need to kind of have to have so that you have something prepared which doesn't sound phony in terms of what you're trying to share with your future employer. You want to be able to give them a meaty example of, of a situation which just didn't go right for you and how you managed to rebound, rebound from it, how you managed to kind of turn it around or if you didn't turn it around, how you manage that situation in the future. Those are the kind of things which really kind of make you real to a future employer. And I think that like that, that is what gives candidates a real edge is confidence of narrative, confidence of example, and being able to show a little bit of like authenticity in the fact that they're not perfect. These are some of the things, these are some of the key learning points they've taken along the way from things that haven't gone so well. I agree with that and I liken it to when someone makes the short list of a board interview and there's probably five other candidates who are on spec that are all going to be really good the way you differentiate yourself is partly about what you've described like you have to be ready to be able to talk to them to know about them you've researched the organization the people doing the interviews etc i don't think that takes hours i think that takes days to bring your best self out um so yeah, I, I think that's absolutely. the right encouragement for everybody and it shouldn't be it shouldn't be underestimated and my responsibility on the back end, if I'm working with my clients, is, hey, if you've always hired a cisgender white man into this boardroom, if you don't even know what a cisgender means, <laughs> if you've always hired a straight white man into the boardroom, then fundamentally, meeting with my incredibly diverse school of candidates may throw you off center a little bit because how they present themselves and present their backgrounds may not be the way that you're used to hearing about people, people's backgrounds and their narratives. So we, it's important that we also kind of make sure that clients are prepared for the individual that they're meeting. So we make sure that the client is prepared, they understand the motivations of the candidate that they're meeting, and they understand some of any sensitivities that they should be aware of as well. So the client is also well positioned because you've got to remember that also when it comes to diversity, these candidates are really scared in many instances. So, so the interviewer really has to also be presenting the best of themselves and the best of their organization in order to secure this talent. This is not a, a, a situation or a century where we're talking about like, oh, thanks for coming in today. Why should I hire you? You know, this is a situation where anyone, anyone in, a, in a nominating committee He's looking to kind of bring somebody into the board needs to be very cognizant about how they're presenting this opportunity as well. And I've heard from a number of chairmen, you know, when they meet with women, they're really conscious that, that often women lead with, you know, what they're building out their portfolio and they'll consider this opportunity and they find that very unnerving. But I'm like, this is just the situation that we're in right now. Women are beginning to build their board portfolio, and they are excited about it, and they do have plenty of opportunities. It's not necessarily an arrogant thing. It is just a authentic way of approaching the situation in order to make sure that you're familiar with how they're looking at this role. And that, again, that comes back to the fact that this, we're in a disruptive era, and we need to make sure that both our clients are prepared for that conversation and don't feel or insulted, but they're prepared. Um, and our candidates are presenting the best themselves. This is a two-way street, and we need to make sure that we're, it's carefully managed in, in order that everyone kind of comes out feeling like they've had a positive experience and that we have the best possible opportunity to actually move the needle. Well, Felicity, we appreciate the great work that you are doing finding the right candidates wherever they are, however they are, whenever they are, 
to bring to a board because the board operates best. It can only have diversity of thought if the boardroom is diverse. And we appreciate how you are pushing that forward to share different ideas and thoughts because companies need to be working through this. And I imagine many of the people listening who are preparing perhaps to be a first-time director or are first-time director thinking, what do we do inside the boardroom now to take ourselves to the next level? These are great food for thoughts items. And I'm delighted that you were on the show today. And thank you for sharing your insights and helping all of us to be boardroom bound. Thank you so much, Alexander. It's been an absolute pleasure. And I'm always happy to speak to any candidates who may be interested in their next board uh, position or indeed looking at, uh, at executive opportunities and they must reach out to me direct. I'd be very happy to speak to them. That's it for this episode of Boardroom Bound. I really enjoyed chatting with Felicity Hassan. It was great to hear how they are doing wonderful work positioning more diverse candidates for the boardroom. We need that. We cannot have diversity of thought if everyone looks, say, pale, male, and stale. And at the same point, all of our audience got something to take away from this because we're thinking about how do we position ourselves uniquely. Each one of us is a special snowflake. We have a different story. How do we get noticed for that and recognized for it? Now, if you head over to podcast.gordon.edu, you can find links to everything we talked about today. And I'd love for you to know that the Boardroom Bound team and I are just so proud to be your go-to podcast for all things that connect, prepare, and empower you to land a board seat. Be sure to subscribe to this podcast so you don't miss any of the high-quality content that we're bringing to you every Wednesday. Now, thanks for joining me today. I can't wait to share more stories and strategies from brilliant business minds with you again next week. Remember to keep tuning in to be Boardroom Bound.